a difficult child from the perspective of the ego, which just wants to be happy, wants to be healthy, doesn't want to have any problems. You would never generate a very problematic child. Uh, so it's often um, a signal that there is indeed something wrong and that your spirit wishes you to become aware of it or to correct it. So in a way the problems with the child can, um, in, can on the one hand be a personal motivation, like okay I need to work on myself, but it can also be a reflection of um, a social um, mission that uh, you need to change things in the world around you, in society, uh, because your child is showing you what is wrong. So for instance if you look at autism, uh, because, because autism has I think like become like tenfold in the last 20 years. Uh, so many parents are now struggling with raising an autistic child and autism is caused by basically chemical pollution of the environment and therefore also by the, the, the host body of the mother. And if we keep on polluting our environment like this, yeah, we get more and more autistic children. So in a way, having an autistic child or an attention deficient child or a hyperactive child is also an imperative for the people, like fix your planet, guys, <laughs> and not just focus only on the child, but they try to indicate or to show us that there's something wrong with the world and we should do something about it. Um, so then the, the, the child is a messenger more from a higher world or from the gods or from Gaia that there is something structurally wrong with the world. But you can also have a child which is difficult on a very, uh, on a very personal level. That they have a lot of traits or lots of qualities which are very challenging for you. And um, often this has to do a lot with um, our ability to love unconditionally. Uh, because in a way love is, is a little bit the glue. Um, it connects us with all other things. And love is not actually uh, opposed by hate. Hate is just another form of love because something you hate and dislike and you want to fight against, you're also connected to it. But you're connected and have a negative emotional experience. While things which we call love, we are connected and we have a positive emotional experience. Um, so for instance, if I um, uh, meet a person I, I love, it is often that it is more of a, um, in a way, a drug. Like I like to feel this way and this is why I react to this connection in this way and something I hate, I just don't want to be around them, I don't want to see them, I don't want to talk to them. And this is like my reaction to that energy. And ultimately what we need to learn is to deal with every energy, to become stable, to become in a way enlightened. So that our reactions, uh, we can of course deal with energies as we like, we have that freedom. But we are no longer governed by the object we connect to. And in a way by having a child who manifests a lot of qualities which we hate, uh, really teaches us to, um, to deal with our own emotions, that we should not, that we should keep the connection and not run away from this connection, but in a way uh, liberate ourselves so that you can say like, okay, this is wrong, but I still love you, or this is very nice, but yeah, uh, that doesn't mean that you can manipulate me. <laughs> um, so, um, a child like that is very much, also a very sweet child is in a way, in the same way a teacher because very sweet children are often very hard to resist and in a way very, they can be very manipulative in nature because parents yeah, dote on them, love them too much. And it's, it's in a way the flip side of a terrible child, but the lesson is the same. It is ultimately to, to liberate yourself from the, uh, the, the emotional storms within so that we become able to see our connection and recognize it for what it is um, without being pre-programmed to, to act in a certain way and really 
allowing our spirit to guide our actions instead of our emotions or our uh, conditioning to control us. Uh, so a child like that is a very big uh, challenge to overcome whatever conditioning you may have and especially your, uh, if you have a conditioning which is moral, which is like okay this is good or this is bad and if your child behaves in a bad way or in an evil way uh, this is a very strong conditioning for you to break yourself out of uh, to see in a way the prison you created for yourself by your idea of good and bad because ultimately every law, every system is narrowing you, is limiting you and ultimately you have to be able to let go of your own idea of good and bad and to trust your own spirit, to trust that you have shaped and transformed yourself enough that the good or the badness is inherent in your being and no longer needs to be enforced by rules or um, systems of conduct and um, that in the same way a child may need certain rules which you no longer need but also to see that it is not your goal in a way to impose rules on yourself or on somebody else but rather to increase their maturity so that in a natural way they will follow the rules uh, through understanding, through maturity, to integration of the principles the rules stand for and so children often also challenge their parents to find out like what do I stand for, what is the higher principle which I serve so there's often a kind of a refinement, a distillation process where the parent has to go out of the crystallization into a deeper awareness, a real wisdom and integration of uh, yeah, what they've worked for so often the child also creates a lot of uh, maturity and liberation in the, in the parents because the children have a very open mind, a very playful attitude and they challenge the parents to go back to that to find again the, the fluidity in them, to find again the fire and the water, the emotions and the inspiration instead of getting stuck in their mind or in their, in their habits. Okay, there is another uh, very interesting question. Uh, so, are there no in accidental pregnancies, but are they planned from a child's perspective? Um, so, the first part of the question um, is um, not every pregnancy is planned by the child, but you can be pretty sure that when there is an opportunity, a spirit will try to use it. Um, because there are a lot of spirits uh, compared to incarnated beings so roughly 20 to 1 and the opportunity to have a body is an opportunity which is sought after um, so what you see in a way with accidental pregnancies or can see with accidental pregnancies is that um, a spirit will just grab the, the opportunity without having planned it through, without having formed a bond with the parents. So uh, this is not always true, it's very hard to see from the outside, but it can happen that the spirit just wants only to have a body and not really a connection with the mother and the father. And this can be very frustrating for the parents because they feel like who is this stranger who lives in our midst, who we give food, who we give love to, but they don't really care about us, they're not interested in us, they're just incarnated in doing their own thing. Uh, so this happens that you in a way have a kind of an intruder, um, a child who neither of the parents have a connection to, it's possible. Um, but it doesn't happen a lot, but I've, I've seen it happen. It doesn't mean that there's always a, a bad relationship with the parents, but it's often a very impersonal relationship. So the child has just their own path and no interest in the parents or sometimes only in one parent, this can also happen. Um, ah, okay. Um, 
second remark is during my pregnancy I talked to a male soul or souls. They were quite old for the first three months, but I always doubted that the spirit was my son. Uh, my son's spirit or a guiding spirit. Maybe it could be both. Um, well, usually what what you uh, what you see is that uh, uh, a spirit tends to take a form which um, the the person you're talking to is most comfortable with. If you are most comfortable talking with women, it will take a female form. If you're most comfortable talking with men, it will take a male form because the spirit in itself is usually neither very male or female. It may have certain qualities, um, but in a way, uh, a, a man uh, can energetically be much more feminine than a woman or the other way around. Um, so the, the the quality of the energy doesn't relate to the to the sexuality of the body uh, in a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Um, what you uh, uh, often find is that the uh, the spirit who wants to incarnate in in the body will start to um, to work on the body because they want to have an energy body which is to their likings. So during the pregnancy, especially during the first few months of the pregnancy, the spirit will come and integrate certain parts of the, of the mother's energy body into its own forming energy body. So it is in a way using parts of the mother to construct its own energy body with. So the spirit will come and go and also after birth, um, the body is not continuously inhabited by the spirit, but usually up to an age of four, uh, the spirit just comes and goes and uh, brings new energies uh, to the body and monitors the, the growth of the body. But as in a way the, the body matures, also the bond and the connection between the spirit uh, and the physical body becomes stronger and stronger. Um, so it is very normal in a way for a spirit to come and visit, especially during, during the first few months. And usually it is the spirit who is um, um, who is incarnating. Um, one thing which does happen, also not, not very often, um, is that if it is a first incarnation uh, as a human being, so if the, the spirit before was a nature spirit or an animal or a plant spirit or comes from another planet, that it will ask a spirit who has much more experience to build its energy body for it because it won't have experience yet with being a human. And a human energy body is very complex, it's a very difficult thing. So it might ask one of your guides or another being which was human before to help it to construct its energy body so it can inhabit it, uh, a very nice structured energy body later. And there are actually spirits who specialize in this. So you could call them almost like midwife spirits who help other spirits to create good energy bodies uh, for them to be born in. So it could be that you were talking with a spirit like this. Okay. Um, so what you see often in these, um, yeah, what you would call in a way midwife spirits or birth spirits who help in this process of integrating the, uh, um, the spirit into a physical body is that there are often people who have, uh, yeah, I can really say, developed themselves to a really amazing level. Uh, so often they've had hundreds of incarnations themselves and they've become like really amazing human beings and often they, because of their qualities, they're offered the opportunity not to incarnate or to move to higher levels of consciousness or to incarnate on other planets where there is a higher consciousness but basically through their, uh, their love, their devotion uh, they in a way sacrifice themselves to become servants even though they are far very advanced spirits they, be, they serve 
like spirits who are just on the brink of starting to understand humanity while they're already masters of humanity. So getting into contact with these spirits for me it's always a very uh, moving, a very humbling experience to see so much love and devotion to carry on with these uh, really very selfless tasks. Um, and these spirits exist for humans uh, but they also exist to, uh, to aid in the births of cats, dogs, cows, um, all kinds of spirits who in a way make the transition between uh, being a purely energetic being and being coupled with a physical being. Um, and um, uh, the other option is also possible. So usually there are spirits who have just lived a lot of lives in that, in that form. Uh, but it is also possible for greater nature spirits like elves uh, to, and trolls to take such tasks. To say like, okay, I'm a nature spirit who also has a lot of power, a lot of experience in guiding and in dealing with the energy bodies of other incarnated beings in my realm. And they can also take on such a task to guide and to protect uh, the process of incarnation. And uh, especially uh, in earlier times, before um, we in a way went away from the nature religions, uh, many humans had deals with nature spirits who helped them to build the energy bodies and to uh, in a way also develop a lot of sensitivity to the natures and to the environments in our energy bodies because we had such guidance. But it is basically because we have started killing and destroying um, these nature spirits that they also become unwilling uh, or unable to help us with our incarnation processes. And this is also creating a lot of problems for people who cannot incarnate completely or cannot incarnate fully because there's not enough spirits to help us and to guide us anymore because of our brutal treatment of um, our nature, the nature spirits who were there to, to help us to, to integrate mind, spirit and body. So this is another like big problem which is manifested by the children who are born there who have this very poor integration between spirit and body that we should stop killing those spirits who help us to, to become well integrated humans. And uh, the spirits who usually take on these tasks are either trolls or elves. Um, elves feeling a, a very general responsibility to life in general or everything within their domain in general. And um, the trolls are very, um, uh, very playful in nature and also very protective in nature. So they're in a way very natural, uh, natural parents to other beings. Um, another thing which you can, uh, which you might see, is that um, the bond you form between parent and child is often also translated into uh, a guidance bond. So for instance if I have a very good relationship with my cat or with my child in this life then in the next life they might uh, come back to, to advise me or to help me uh, during my uh, new incarnation. Um, so also animal spirits can be really uh, part of a family. Uh, in the same way as human spirits can. Ah, oh, yes, this is a very beautiful question. Uh, so, thank you. So is it so that you can see in the child's eyes a layer in time? For instance, I once could see right through the eyes of my son without any layers, but then it seems like there was a layer or a filter before the eyes. 
when he was a bit older. Is this the transition of the soul and the body being connected firmly? And they were shining brightly and more shining inwardly. Uh, there's two processes here. Um, there's a physical process of the pigmentation uh, because when a child is born there is yeah, no exposure to, to sunlight so there's also not an impulse to create pigment and there's also no real... Um, and also during growth it is usually um, uh, not so present. It is usually as we grow older we grow darker and until a certain age and then we grow whiter again. Uh, so it's a, a natural maturation process. So always the baby's eyes are, are blue and then they become green and then they become brown. Um, so this is a natural process. Um, but also it happens indeed very much on an energetical level. Um, because one of the things which, uh, uh, which also happens um, is that we um, start using other chakras because um, uh, some people have like this, the magical sight or the evil eye or whatever it is called they can use their eye chakras very well um, because the eye chakras are very open and this is also true for a child uh, child eyes in a way uh, they see the truth they see the reality of things they are not fooled by illusions or talk or other things. They can just pierce through a lot of things. And um, uh, this is a quality which children in general possess. But m most bloodlines it is lost. Like for instance in a gypsy bloodline it is retained. But in most bloodlines people lose this quality. And this is because they start to use other chakras. And... Um, this is a process of identification. So once the first chakra starts to develop, people start to identify with the body. And then when the second chakra develops, they start to, start to identify with the desires. And ultimately the spirit gets trapped in the personality it creates. And once this personality is not yet completely formed, so usually before the third chakra really starts to, to be created, then often the, uh, the spirit will still... Um, be very open. It will have no preconception of what is right or wrong or fitting or correct or not. And while there is no individual style yet, often these eye chakras are still quite open. And it is usually when the third chakra starts to develop that the eye chakra starts to, to, to dim and to close because in a way the person's acceptance starts to narrow. Their method is like, okay, I am a person and I want things to be this way and they're no longer open-minded or open-spirited anymore. And the closure of the, of the, the uh, eye chakras usually happens between the age of three and six. This is a typical age when this uh, starts to dim. Sometimes it starts earlier at the age of two already that uh, the spirit in a way becomes trapped by the development of the third chakra and the closure of the of the eye chakras so this is in a way the uh, because every the development of every chakra is in a way a layer uh, a trap in by which the personality uh, blocks or limits the the freedom of the spirit uh, but depending on the quality of the personality which is built up uh, there can be more or less limitation and it's usually really um, uh, the development of uh, the third chakra and the sixth chakra which creates most blockages. The third chakra is because it's in a way the child starts to develop the ego, the self, like I want this and I want this in this way. And this is a very strong limitation. And the third chakra is basically the learning of what is supposed, what is right, what is the accepted behavior and then also very much of the original freedom gets lost because you have to integrate yourself into society into what is accepted what is normal what is normal by in that time or in that culture so the uh, if you want to in a way free the spirit and become much more open and much more natural 
uh, you tend to have to work a lot on the on the throat chakra to deprogram that and also on the third chakra to get rid a little bit of this ego perspective um, which is basically a very um, conflictive perspective the ego exists to fight for you it is there to make you survive in a hostile world and it can fight for you but it can also become overprotective and then it limits the spirit okay I see we've talked on for quite a while almost two hours now uh, so I would like to uh, to thank you for your uh, yeah, for your time and also for these really very inspiring and very beautiful, amazing questions. Uh, so it's been a blessing to talk to you again. And I hope to talk to you again next week when we'll continue with the runes. <laughs>